thought it would be interesting to talk from a Paleolithic perspective because um, as a geoarchaeologist who works both in the in the Paleolithic um, Pleistocene and the Holocene, I became aware that you sort of discuss things in the Holocene and they become somebody else in the Pleistocene in terms of we don't talk about environmental archaeology, at least from my perspective when I work in the Quaternary. We're all Quaternary scientists or something like that. So there's something different between the way in which we're working between the Holocene and the, and the Pleistocene. So that's really um, sort of where I'm coming from. So I don't really mean let's forget environmental archaeology, but I just thought, you know, it was something to say. Um, so if we go back to Carl Busser, um in 1971, he makes that statement there. I don't need to read it for you. You can all read it um, for yourself. Um, but I wondered whether this was, was really true for Paleolithic archaeology. And as someone who's worked in Paleolithic archaeology since um, 1981, uh, starting at Boxgrove, I, you know, and, and I've continued on in the Paleolithic world since then, I thought, well, I've got a reasonable sort of understanding perhaps of, of some, some of these things that might be useful just to run past you. So in the Paleolithic we don't seem to get this great heated debate that you get in later prehistory between the, the, the you know, environmental archaeologists and the theoreticians and I wondered why that was. Um, it, it isn't really to the fore. I mean, do we not do theory? Um, is it so embedded in our practice that we don't notice it? Um, or did it just go below the radar in some, in some, sort, of session, uh, in some sort of sense? And um, I'm not really going to come to any great conclusions about that, but um, it's just interesting to think why we don't have this heated um, debate between, between the different people in the, in, the, in the discipline. So perhaps there's something fundamental, fundamentally different about the way we do Paleolithic archaeology from the way you do archaeology um, later on. And I think this also comes back to some discussion we were having about the teaching of geoarchaeology um, earlier today and, and whether those of us that are doing Paleolithic archaeology are dealing with geoarchaeology and teaching it to our students in a way that we're not doing with, 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 with Holocene archaeology. Um, what are the differences? It's hugely interdisciplinary, probably in the, in the Paleolithic, more so. I know I'm teaching to the converted here, but we're, we're talking about very large casts of, of saints and sinners in, in the Paleolithic. Um, and, and so perhaps there's a greater range of, of, of characters that we're dealing with um, here. Of course, much of lower Paleolithic archaeology is devoid of contexts um, that, uh, you know, pits and, and, and so forth. I mean, as you go um, into the later Paleolithic, we start to see these things. So we are talking about um, a geological um, framework. And we don't see excavators filling in context sheets in the same way that we do for later, <coughs> later prehistory and historic archaeology, where they're having to interpret things at that point in the field. Um, and I think that probably is having a, 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 an influence on the way in which uh, we do things. Perhaps we're thinking uh, more in advance and, and more in, in hindsight, but that sort of um, place for debate is not happening in, in, so much, perhaps, in, in the field. If we look at the characters who are doing the archaeology, whether it's in a purely research basis of the research excavations or um, the contract excavations, it's the same sets of people largely. And again, this differs, I think, to a certain extent from later prehistory, um, where there's more of a division perhaps between certainly the contract archaeology and the academics, and, and you know, there certainly is this sort of um, divide. Um, so the people who are undertaking the field look at the people who are setting the agendas, the research themes um, and the <coughs> strategic research, and these are from the uh, English Heritage Historic England um, guidelines, I think from 2008, that, that, that are driving the way in which we think about the discipline. So research work and contract work are undertaken very often by the same people, and so the academic professional divide is not so um, so uh, much. Um, so we've got people like Francis Van Van Smith there or, or Simon Parfit on the, on the far side um, who are fully embedded in both the academic side and the contract research side. 
And the other thing is that we often go back to the same sites time and time again to reinvestigate those sites with new frameworks and new paradigms, which perhaps doesn't happen so much in, in later, later prehistory. So once in a generation, people go back to Swanscombe and have a look at Swanscombe again and apply the new ideas from the new theoretical perspective to that site. Um, so perhaps that's also um, a difference. So I, I, just, I looked at a few of the better known excavations. I didn't trawl extensively for all the Paleolithic archaeological excavations just to see what um, was actually going on here. So on the left there we've got traditional research excavations, Barnum, Swanscombe, uh, the work that I'm involved in, Lacotte. And then uh, on the far side, developer funded excavations such as Linford, um, Harnham and the Ebbs Fleet Elephant. And if you look at the um, the range of people who are involved in all of those projects, what I've just simply done there in um, uh, blue, I think it is, people who are involved in four or more projects, um, green three or more projects, just to show you how overlapping these both research projects, the sort of intermediate ones and the uh, contract ones are in terms of the personnel that are driving um, the, 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 the investigation. That's the same data, just uh, quantified the number of individuals there and you can see there's quite substantial people who are crossing across all of those uh, boundaries. So from a, th a theoretical perspective, I'm not a the theoretical archaeologist, I'm not, you know, I'm not quite sure what I am, but um, uh, you know, if you look back to, to, to Child in, in, in 1951, he, he, he's saying that about uh, Paleolithic archaeology. Um, of course, we were influenced by Binford in, in the 1960s and the 1970s in his um, arguments with uh, Board. So, Paleolithic archaeology was was you know right in the middle of the, the theoretical debate uh, back then. And then, as we come on into the 1990s, Clive Gamble shifted the agenda um, and started move, moving towards looking at society in his 1999 book. And eventually, we've come to the individual like the scatter at Boxgrove there um, in 2005 with the, with the volume that Gamble and Poor published, looking at the individual. So we see through, the, um, through those years that Paleolithic archaeology has been located within a, in a, a, a clearly theoretical framework, and that's gone on. And the people, again, who are contributing to that Gamble and Poor volume that's the, that's part of the you know there's a box grove project paper in there and and these are the people who are actually um, excavating that site. So um, you know I, I I talk about geography I, in the title I see that the um, the place that we're at at the present time is 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 coming back to where Butzer was in 1971 saying that prehistoric geography is a convenient designation that's recently been. Um, has come up again in, in Clive's book from 2013, where his um, theme, as he states there, is archaeological geography. Um, and it's the focus of things that uh, John Gowlett has been saying, the inter eternal triangle there, detailed environmental knowledge fitting into that um, concept. Um, as I'm running out of time, I'm going to say quickly on, so how does this work in practice? Just showing how a site like La Cote de saint Brelard on Jersey um, has, um, over the time it's being excavated since the, the mid 19th century or late 19th century, its, its excavation, its interpretation has followed these changes in um, the sort of theoretical perspective. Back in the late 19th century and into the early 20th century, this is the top of the, the cave sites um, there and, and the photograph you can see on the left there is when the teeth, the Neanderthal teeth were found. And people like Marit Sunel and uh, Nicole excavating in the early part of the 20th century were trying to place um, <clears throat> the archaeology um, in relationship to human species, in this case the Neanderthals, which is very much the sort of framework they were working in um, at that time. By the 1970s, when um, McBurney's work in the cave was being um, written up by Paul Callow and um, Kate Scott, the uh, mammoth bone assemblages were interpreted very much in the, in the framework that um, <coughs> Binford and, and, and so forth were coming out of that sort of interpretation. Um, and that's where that, that um, level of 
um, writing uh, is, is placed. And now today we've taken, um, we're, we're moving forward and looking at the uh, distribution of artifacts within the cave system as persistent places in the landscape where we're looking at the scale of the individual to the bigger geographical picture, um, which is where, where we're currently um, situated. So the theoretical background to the way people have interpreted the site has changed through time. We can think of um, many of these things happening at the same time, perhaps, in Paleolithic archaeology. So when you look at a site like Swanscombe, and this is the sequence in the middle for Swanscombe there, um, and we think about the different geological units and what they mean about time and space, we can see the sort of big picture um, aggregates of um, uh, artefacts within, um, within the gravels at the top there as representing <coughs> stories that are going on, big landscape st scale stories um, of the sort that uh, 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 Petit and White comment on in, in their book and, and these graphs are simply showing the number of artifacts per Thames Terrace sequence from top diagram there, that's the uh, uh, Swanscombe, uh, Boyne Hill gravel and simply using that to look at big scale demography across the Pleistocene from those sorts of uh, gravel contexts um, through to the individuals in the same parts of the stratigraphic sequence so we're able to then zoom down at a different scale at a different um, level of uh, investigation to the individual associated in this case with the butchery of that straight tusked elephant at the South Fleet Road site and so the um, <clears throat> the scales of investigation and the, the, the focus of that investigation shifting from the, the big, um, big narrative in, in human evolution down to the individual, all in the same um, site or in the same complex of deposits. Um, which then brings us on to thinking about you know, how we interpret individuals, um, uh, flakes individual finds at low levels in the environment, a single uh, instance of somebody doing something at a location in space. Um, in this case, this is an example from Dartford where a few artifacts um, in a particular geological unit uh, are, are quite controversial in what they're saying perhaps about when humans were here and when they weren't here. Um, but thinking about the artifacts in geographical space, whether at the big picture or at the um, localized individual event, um, is important in this context because not only is it set telling us something hopefully about um, uh, about human presence in the landscape but it's also dictating things such as how do we go about evaluating these things how do we interpret single um, single flakes and so forth as we push our discipline out and back into the developer funded world um, so I just finished with that um, hopefully you know I, I've shown how uh, Paleolithic archaeology is working, how it has worked over the past hundred years, that it is embedded within this within this theoretical um, concept, uh, but perhaps we're using different people's theories linked together, different ways of thinking linked together, um, and that's just in there. It, it's not um, well, it, there it is. I mean, that's, that's, that's the way in which we seem to work. So uh, I'll leave it there and ask for any questions.